There is a stream of thought in Christian theology that says that God is constant and that God is never changing. That the whole world may be in a state of flux, even chaos, but not God. Certainly not God. What God says, God always means, always has, and always will. And I sort of like that. I sort of like that. You see, it gives me comfort when all else is in chaos that God is constant, sure, and reliable. That you can count on God living up to God's word, especially when that word is good news. Good news that there is promise and hope and love and deliverance for all of God's children. I like that. You can take that to the bank. But there are other times when I want God to change course. God to not follow through with what God has said. For we are fallible human beings, all of us, and we are prone to messing up often, being selfish and disobedient and willful. And God has said in many different ways that such persons will reap a bad harvest. That the outcome will not be good, may even be very bad. And so my plea would be, God, can't you make some exceptions? Can't you cut us some slack? Can't you intervene on our behalf and change what would otherwise be the expected outcome? And the good news, the good news is that God has done exactly that over and over again. The image we find in the lesson from Jeremiah, the Old Testament, is of a potter, a potter working at a potter's wheel. I don't know if you've ever done that before, but the potter puts his lump of clay on the wheel and then skillfully centers it on the revolving surface. And then that clay is pulled and squeezed and shaped until it becomes something useful. And in many cases, something very beautiful. But even good clay, very good clay is often uneven. Sometimes it contains lumps and other impurities. And even good potters sometimes make mistakes. They get impatient, or perhaps they change their mind as the wheel is turning. So at times, the potter starts over again, takes it back to a clump, centers it on the wheel, begins with the water and the hands to shape it, and it becomes something again something different from what it had been initially. Well, says the prophet Jeremiah, God is something like that resourceful potter. Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. At one moment I may declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it. But if that nation, concerning which I have spoken, turns from its evil, I will change my mind about the disaster that I intended to bring on it. Friends, that's the good news that God can change in midstream, deciding to change course and move in a different direction, that God can be a God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances, both for nations and importantly for us, for individuals. Not that God is frivolous or wishy-washy or fickle, Rather, God always errs on the side of mercy, of understanding, of forgiveness, of redemption, 
and does that the second time, and then the third time, and then the fourth time, and who knows how many times after that. You see, God desperately wants the world and its people to thrive and to survive and to do well. There is no death wish in God, no delight in bad outcomes, even though they may be predictable and even deserved. God is a God of hope, God of reconciliation, a God who always offers the promise of a better tomorrow, a better tomorrow. It was the lot of Jeremiah to be God's prophet, the voice of God's intention and God's will at a very trying time. The Assyrian Empire, which had conquered Israel, the northern kingdom, had collapsed under its own weight, leaving a vacuum of power in that part of the world until the Babylonians came along and filled the void. In this brief window of relative calm, Judah, the remaining southern kingdom, thrived for a time, but they couldn't hold that line. They decayed into injustice and violence, abuse of the poor, lies, in general turning away from God and God's intentions. And so Jeremiah, as prophet, saw his task as reminding them about the God who had delivered them out of their slavery in Egypt and brought them into this promised land, given them a place to be and to live and to thrive. They could still turn from their stubbornness, Jeremiah said, their deceitfulness. There was still time for them to repent and to choose a better way, still time. Jeremiah said, look, I am a potter shaping evil against you and devising a plan against you. Turn now, all of you, from your evil way and amend your ways and your doings. Second chance. Jeremiah, on God's behalf, offers a way out for them, seeking a change of their behavior that would lead God to have a change of heart. Jeremiah believed that the potter could reshape the clay if the clay were responsive and cooperative. If the clay were responsive and cooperative. Judah could still survive and learn to live in peace and justice if they would turn to God, mend their ways, and shape up. Jeremiah offered to them the God of second chances. And I think a God of second chances is exactly the kind of God that I need. Maybe you as well. The Apostle Paul in Romans 7 tells it straight about the inner struggle in Paul's life, maybe ours as well. Paul said, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil that I do not want is what I do. Wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the Apostle Paul. The God of second chances, most clearly seen, I think, in Jesus of Nazareth, the one we seek to follow. We find this theme over and over in the Bible stories, stories of lives reclaimed and forgiven through the grace-filled persistence of a loving God. We find this in the story Jesus told about the banquet. The persistence of the host to fill his banquet hall invited guests, street people, the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame, all invited in. 
And then the host reaches out even farther into the streets and the lanes, casting as wide a net as possible to include as many as possible, those who would respond, so the table could be filled, so the banquet could be enjoyed, so all would enjoy the fellowship and the hospitality of the host. First chance people, second chance people, even last chance people, come on in. Now, it's also true that there are a couple of Bible stories that reveal an interesting trait in those who consider themselves to be God's good people. These would be the ones who responded early to God's call, got in early, like the elder son who stayed home with the father while the younger son wasted the family wealth, yet to feel good about that elder son. Or the Pharisee who publicly told God how good he was, not like that sinner over there. Or those workers who came to work in the fields early in the day. Not like those latecomers who showed up at the end of the day, but got the same pay. These Early people are the ones who are a bit upset with a God who caves in and doesn't sufficiently punish those who disobey God or abuse God's grace. God giving them a second chance? Why? God ought to insist on God's standards, shape up or suffer the consequences, cause and effect. I don't know about you, but I am quite satisfied with a God of second chances. I like the image of God working with me on the potter's wheel, working with my lumps and my imperfections, reshaping my poor choices, still striving to make something useful of my life, maybe even something that has lasting qualities, still working on the clay with me, I need the image of a God working on others on that potter's wheel, seeing the other as still a work in progress, yes, imperfect to be sure, not always very lovable, and yet God can still redeem that person, still shape that person if that person is willing maybe even into someone more beautiful than we can yet imagine. I need the image of a world around us still worthy of God's brooding presence, struggling to reshape the misguided decisions of nations and causing something, to, something good to come forth out of the uh, narrowness of our prejudices and opinions. I need the image of a future not yet cast in stone, a future still rich with possibilities, still pregnant with hope. I need that for the sake of my grandchildren, for the sake of those who will inhabit this good earth long after I'm gone. So picture God with rolled up sleeves, hunched over a potter's wheel, hands pulling and squeezing and shaping each one of us with the uh, clay still wet, still malleable, still able to be shaped. Picture a God of mercy and forgiveness reshaping lives gone bad and hopes dashed, reshaping them into lives scarred for sure, but still useful and even lovable. 
picture a God who sends out the invitations to come to the banquet. And then when we don't show up, scurrying around to make sure we do show up for all our welcome at the table, all our welcome into God's hospitality, God's love. Amen.